Hello and welcome to Your Business, Your Wealth with your hosts, Paul Adams, founder, CEO of Sound Financial Group. And I'm joined by Corey, president and partner of Sound Financial Group. Corey, so glad you could be here today. I cannot wait for our fun format for this and our next few episodes. I think this is really exciting today. And I think I thought you were going to announce me like a like a prize fighter. You said, Corey, the president, Shepard, except the Shepard didn't <laughs> show up there. So that's kind of the, it fits with our theme and the bell that we're going to have, uh, which you're going to explain here. In Indeed. So what we're going to do, we're going to cover 100 things, 100 things you shouldn't do to help get your finances in order. These are the major mistakes we see people make. And these are things that we're gathering and in hopes of giving you the chance to learn from a mistake that you didn't have to make personally. See, one of the big problems with money is that these are not mistakes you get to learn from. They're mistakes that you have to live with if you're the one that makes them. So all the better that we can learn from the mistakes that other people had to live with. But we're going to add a little time fun to today's topic, which is on each of the 25 we're going to cover in this episode, we're going to limit all of our commentary to one minute. We're going to read the topic. Either Corey or myself are going to say go. When we say go, there's a one minute timer running. You guys will hear it if it goes off. If it does go off, we are stopping completely right where we are and moving on to the next one. They also may not take us a full minute to cover, in which case we're going to reset, restart, and give a minute to the next one. So with that, Corey, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, are so you I'm ready? Gonna, I am ready. We are <laughs> going to read the topic, and then when I say go is when our one minute starts. I hope everybody, yeah. whether you're in a car, you're out at a workout, if you're working out and you're doing some kind of Tabata drill, this will work perfect for perfect. our one minute sprints. <laughs> <laughs> Although you won't remember a thing when your pulse is 170 because you've got the treadmill up at eight miles an hour for one minute, but perhaps you'll be able to to absorb in the two minutes you took as downtime in between the next Tabata drill. Right. With that, owning, th again, 100 things you shouldn't do to get your finances in order. First one is own less than 1 million of umbrella insurance, go. Oh my goodness. It's the easiest product to get in the PNC world from a cost standpoint. It costs less than your car insurance, but most people don't have it. And we're in such a litigious society uh, you know, I think about my wife and all the doctors that they work, I work with. And, uh, if one of them rear ended someone on the way to work and that person got out of the car feeling fine, but then saw the lab coat and all of a sudden their neck hurts and they're like, Oh man, this has been a problem. Now this really activated this sciatica and my, and then, and, <laughs> and then I the lawsuit starts. I have gout, start. I have gout now, I have gout now, perhaps from being rear ended, it's hard rear end induced gout. Well, and it's, and it's attaching your income also. So it's not just your yeah. assets. We were actually talking uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina to some amazing, you know, up and coming financial executives. And one of the things we mentioned was they can attach your income, not just your assets. You should have seen these guys go white in a need to want to get themselves protected. Next. Oh, we'll do the next one. I've got to uh, the stopwatch I'm using has to be reset for me. Uh, not having pictures of your home's contents. Go. I think so, this one's easy. If you don't have pictures of your home's contents, how are you going to prove to the homeowner's insurance company if you had a major loss, theft, fire, flood? How are you going to prove to them what you had? I've Maybe. heard that there's some forensic ways to reconstruct your possessions from the ashes that remain, but I just... It's not my idea of fun to be digging through the ashes in my house that is just burned down. I would rather tell the insurance company, like, here's the the you know CD or thumb drive of what my home used to look like. I'll be waiting in the hotel that you paid for until it looks like that again. That's a really simple outcome. Absolutely. If I was interested in uh, the forensic discoveries I could have by digging through ashes, I would have become an archaeologist and be digging in Pompeii today. Next. <laughs> All right. Next is not building an emergency fund. Paul, go. If you don't have an emergency fund, so let's define what that is. That is liquid funds set aside in enough capital to carry you for up to a year of household expenses. Now, we have to have it for a couple of fold reasons. One is for the emergency that could happen. Transmission falls out of a car. Uh, somebody has high medical bills. 
those things which maybe have you not not working but do have you in a position that there's some expenses you didn't ex anticipate and you don't want to have to sell your investments or cash out retirement funds early in that instance but i met somebody today who had one uh, or yesterday had a beautiful one of those really cool all electric cars that basically are a Maserati, but now nobody judges you based upon the fact that you <laughs> bought a sports car in your mid forties. It's virtue signaling since it's electric, but that guy's been out of work since February and things are starting to get tight. If he had this full emergency fund, he wouldn't have that problem. Done. One second to spare. Next, <laughs> no spending plan. Corey, go. I'll start this off with, this is one of the reasons why folks aren't able to build an emergency fund because they're spending, 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 and they don't know where their money went every month. It keeps thinking, where did all this money go? I have all this income, where did it all go? Well, if you aren't constantly telling your money where to go, you will always be wondering where it went. And that's why we need that, that active plan. Because the point is not to spend zero. We have money, we need to deploy it into our life to get something that we want out of, you know, have the kind of life that we want. So let's have a plan for the kind of life we want, the spending that we need to do to get there, and the long-term asset accumulation that we're going to produce out of that to let us keep having the life we want and keep spending the money that we want. Corey, Done. you've got 10 seconds left. I want you to answer a question. Do you notice that people don't need spending plans at a certain level of income? Never. The, the higher the level of income, the more important the spending plan is. Perfect. And you just made it. <laughs> I wanted to say more about that. Dang it. Okay. Yeah, I know. See, I get, I get, I hopefully got the audience uh, mouth watering too for that next one. Mm. Not making a first day of the month bill that is your commitment to investment. Go. So everybody talks about this idea of pay yourself first, but if you go down the path of pay yourself first, you will end up with a fundamental breakdown, which is it's showing up to you like a bill. And what do people do? They put it in a savings account. Now, if you've been through our client process or heard much of our philosophy, you'll know that we talk about the fact that society has programmed us that we save money so that we can spend it later. And the real problem with that is, well, we don't need to save money and then spend it. We need to set money aside and buy assets. But if we don't have a strategy where the first thing we do every month is put money into a separate account, we call it a wealth coordination account whose only purpose then is to buy assets, then we will never have a disciplined strategy of asset acquisition. And ultimately, the only way we'll have autonomy and freedom over our lifetime is if we're setting money aside consistently to assets in enough of an amount to then let the capital at work pay our bills when we want to be at definite financial independence and have our work optional lifestyle. Well, we'll allow that one because the bell was still like echoing through the halls. So that's that's fine. Well, we're cutting it close. O official warning. Yeah. It's like yeah. your yellow yellow card. <laughs> All right, Corey. In that case, let's pivot back to you. Great. Only saving what is left. So again, 100 things you shouldn't do to help get your finances in order. Only save what is left after you spend. The problem here is that we'll always get more of the thing that we focus the most of our attention on. So if we put all of our focus on spending first, and then what's left over is what we get to spend, uh, save, then spending is the catalyst. Spending is the operant activity in our life, and that's just only going to expand. So what we need to do is do the saving first. Paul mentioned the theories like pay yourself first. It, it, the, that is a great philosophy for this part of the idea that we're talking about, we need to make the saving goal or the asset building goal first, and then let the spending take care of itself after out of what's left, not the other way around. And there's too many tiny decisions to make every single day in spending to focus solely on spending. So if we focus on the asset building first, the brain will figure it all out in the background with what's what's left. But if you're deciding every day how to save, you'll never make the right choices over time. All right, that was mine. Okay. My okay. Corey, I'm going to propose this one and then uh, I'll take the second one following this. Okay. So number seven is have no disability insurance. Go. All of us 
by law have to own car insurance and we own car insurance on something that depending on our car costs anywhere from two thousand dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on on who you are but it's usually a fairly significant portion of our annual income but our annual income multiplied by the number of years that we expect to have left to work is always a much higher value than whatever that car is yet so many folks don't have protection on their income and income cash flow on your balance sheet is the thing that makes everything else possible it's the raw ingredients the raw energy that lets us do everything else in life it's your most valuable asset i can almost guarantee it no matter what phase of your life you're you're at and it's worth protecting because the loss of it would be catastrophic nice all right, right next to the paul post. have group disability insurance only go so if you think about your group disability insurance periodically we'll have people that are you know a little bit savvy with their investments and insurances and one thing that we'll hear a lot is well my group disability insurance is so inexpensive or my employer pays for it so why would i want to pay for something additional on top of it well there's a few fold number one many times your group disability insurance premium what is paid for is paid for by your employer your employer deducts those premiums, which means if they replace 60% of your base income, then that will be taxable. So let's just call it 33% that what you end up with after 60% is only 40% after you pay taxes. Part two is with the level of income of most of our clients, a decent amount of their income is actually incentive comp, typically not covered by group disability insurance, meaning a large swath if double the amount of your income is salary and bonus you or bonus and commissions you may not get your whole income replaced and having individual coverage that covers all of that puts you in the position you get the greatest likelihood of replacing your entire income <laughs> sorry for going over the mark on that one okay Corey, to keep us on pace i'll pivot back to you in a hurry and what we're going to do is confuse your emergency fund with money that can buy assets confusing your emergency fund with money that could buy assets. Ready? Go. All right, so your emergency fund has one job, to be available, be liquid, and be available for whatever might happen to, from like right this instant to tomorrow. Money that's gonna buy assets, money that you're gonna invest and grow in the market is a long-term horizon that might be, you know, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, somewhere on down the road. Those are two very different purposes. So the financial industry loves to have people feel bad about not having their money work for them, thinking, oh, you're just getting 0.1% interest in the bank. You could be putting that money to work and earn something for you. Well, there's different kinds of rate of return on money. And the rate of return of having a certain amount of money available at any moment for whatever emergency might arise is the best kind of rate of return for that bucket we don't want any other kind of rate of return money that's going to buy assets totally different expectation i'm going to give those four seconds back because we went over on the last one boom perfect okay and uh i'm just letting jordan know who's handling all of our video here in studio what i'm going to do is i'm going to jump over and i'll use this one instead so that we don't have to worry about it all right I'm start another timer on my computer go ahead save less than 15 percent of income go all right. I don't know why this is that somewhere in our history, setting aside 10% for the future became the quote unquote responsible thing to do. Now, I don't know if this comes out of our Judeo-Christian values and the idea of giving 10% to God. I guess 10% to my future is a good idea. But I think it may also come from a time when 10% was enough when you also had a pension. But vast majority of people do not have any retirement plans or pensions that are guaranteed from their employers any longer. So it really becomes the minimum is 15 percent and you now we've been able to do this with studies looking at somebody who say started their career at a low level of income had an ever increasing trend of increases in income that at a minimum starting at age 22 at the beginning of their career they need to set aside 15 percent to have enough money that it would replace the other 85 percent that was being consumed during their working years the later you start the higher that number goes so we coach most of our clients to be at 20 percent of gross minimum savings rate one second remaining. Corey, I'm going to switch back to okay. you. That's number 11. And I think you've got some great stuff from your yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Quick plug, Corey Shepard. I don't want this to eat up your time. 
Corey Thank Shepard's you. Cape Not Required. What of the books you could potentially receive if you give us an honest review on iTunes? That like, that review, the subscribe, and saying something in there makes a big difference for us in our analytics. That's why we send you a copy of a book. Send us a screenshot of that of to info at sfgwa.com, and we'll send you a copy of Corey Shepard's book, Cape Not Required, in which he may say something about financing, number 11, financing anything beyond its likely serviceable lifetime could be one of the things that does not contribute to you getting your financial life in order. Corey, go. So in any com in any consumer purchase, the bigger that ticket item is, the more lengths that the seller will go to to get you out the door at whatever monthly payment is going to get you uh, to where you need to be in your budget. And that's where they focus. But if you think about a car, uh, it, well, let me tell you the story about myself. So embarrassing because I was already a financial advisor. Granted, a brand new one, but this is the reason why you don't want to just go take someone's advice because they have a license. I bought my first car on my own and didn't pay attention to how they were getting me down to the monthly payment I wanted, signed without really reading too closely. And it was only two years later I realized that I was in a loan that was several years longer than I thought on a car that was already used, meaning I was never gonna own more of the car than the loan. And so you always wanna be careful and know that you, you're gonna get ahead of that purchase at some point, that you're truly gonna own it and own the value that it has uh, and read the fine print in your car purchases. Paul, number 12, number carry 12. credit card debt. Go. Carrying credit card debt can be a terrible idea. And it goes back to what Corey just spoke about. We're probably financing something longer than its serviceable lifetime. So if, for instance, you buy a vacation to Hawaii on credit cards, the serviceable lifetime of that trip to Hawaii is about as long as it takes to take the trip to Hawaii. But if what you're going to do is be making those payments over the next 10 years, there's a reason why there's an exorbitant amount of interest paid on credit cards. And it's because you're borrowing for something that the actual item is not having to be put up for any kind of collateral. So whatever you choose to buy, a shirt, a coat, uh, a vacation, an experience at dinner are all massively perishable, which is why they put the lien against your future income. And... If you run credit card debt that finances things longer than their serviceable lifetime and you don't pay it off at the end of the month, it is a wind blowing against you unnecessarily. One second nice. left. <clears throat> Would it be okay if I take the next two since they also tie it to credit cards? I want to take the next one. I've you got some good, let one. me start Corey, off. I'll go Corey really quick. Shepherd, then, Corey yeah. Shepard, would you please share with our audience in 100 things you shouldn't do to help get your finances in order? Number 13, pay off credit card debt without setting aside money to assets. Or without saving. So the classic financial advice is maximize that snowball on your debt. Pay it off as soon as possible and then move over to building up your savings account. Except there was something that got the debt there in the first place some kind of habit. And if you don't take care of that, the debt's just gonna creep back up. How do you prove to yourself that you have different habits? Paying off the debt and saving at the same time. So you have one going down and one going up. The other reason is that if something happens and you've just paid off your credit card without having any savings account, say your car breaks down, you're going right back on the credit card to take care of that problem. And that backsliding can be the most demoralizing part of the whole thing and that it can feel, it can just have you drop the whole process to begin with. So doing both at the same time gives you real progress and proves to yourself that you're not just going to be ending up right back on the same side of the cycle. Done. Right on. Number 14, pay off debt with money that should own assets. Go. So you see this periodically where what people will do is they put themselves in a position that they're like, oh, this debt is just getting too big. So I'm going to cash out my... 401k for my prior employer and pay down this debt. And it's just going to give us a great restart. Or I'm going to take some money out of investments or my home sale. And I'm going to just pay off this debt. And, and by the way, there are times that that could be appropriate and let you get ahead of things. The trouble is what the mental accounting that was done by you when you acquired these things, the mental accounting was I'm going to spend $20,000 on this thing over here or a series of things that creeped up on the credit card. Once you pay it off, you know you're paying off consumer items. You're not likely to be able to set aside or save all of that money. 
So first, make sure to Corey's point, we can put money to assets and put money to paying down credit card debt. Be sure that that's working so that when you do, if necessary, pay off all the credit card debt, you can actually take the remaining cash flows and move them all to your wealth coordination account. Number 15, thinking you can time the market. So out of a 10 year period, there's something like 5,000 ish trading days that the market's open and you can buy things, get in and out of, of positions. And over that period, depending on the period, something like 10 to 20 days, 10 to 20 single days out of 5,000 is somewhere in the realm of 50% of the total rate of return. When the market returns, it doesn't do it linearly over time. It does it in big dumps. How are you going to know which of those days is the right day to get in, which is the right day to get out? It can be almost impossible. And there's no academic evidence. No one who is not making money trying to make you think you can has ever published a paper that says that you can predictably outguess the market getting in and out at the right time. Done. Right on. Nice work. Okay. So 16. we're 16. 16. So I'm someone. Gonna... What else? <laughs> yeah, Go think ahead. someone else can time the market. Go. All right, so to pick up on where Corey left off, it was 5,040 trading days. And if you missed the top 10, the top 20 trading days over a 20 year period from 1998 to the end of 2017, you effectively had zero return. And some of the newest academic evidence is even showing that as little as 4% of the actual traded securities each year will likely have made up an inordinate amount, like 70 plus percent of all equity profits in a particular year. That is key. And it's impossible for people to select who those are gonna be in advance. The Morningstar criteria, the studies at the University of Chicago prove time and time again, most of these asset managers that are saying they can outperform the market actually don't when assessed against an academic standard. So not only can you not time the market, neither can the asset manager you're hiring to do so. Nicely done. All right, trust others with your financial decisions. Go. So this, this goes to abdicating your financial decisions. We see all too often that somebody, like maybe one spouse will say, well, I don't handle any of the money stuff, just my husband or my wife does all of that. I'm not usually a part of those meetings. I don't find it interesting. The other thing that sometimes happens is people say, I don't know, we just do what our CPA says, or I don't know, we'll just trust what our advisor says. I'll tell you right away, if you're considering working with us and you were to say, I just want to trust you and we'll do what you say, that'll get you a really confronting conversation with us. With a sparkle in our eye and a smile on our <laughs> face, we're going to tell you that that'll get you fired from being a client of ours because we need our clients to be responsible for their decisions. When you know you're responsible and you can't put blame anywhere else, you're more likely to be more diligent about thinking about and acting upon the decisions you make, abdicating to others, whether it's your spouse or somebody else, has you not be as responsible. Great. Let's see. Next, I lost my track track on the list. Uh, oh, number 18. 17. Uh, 18. You oh, just, 18. Yeah. Not having a financial strategy. Corey, you ready for this one? Ready. Go. So if you don't have a strategy laid out as far as where you want to go, how do you know that you're making progress towards getting there? Life, as uh, as Mike Tyson, one of my favorites, public figures of all time says like I think, I think you you often call him a philosopher that you look up to read his <laughs> writings consistently and appreciate his face I'm, tattoos I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm not pretty sure that's what you say when we're not on the podcast I'm, he's I'm a pretty, pretty sure sage it. philosopher so he says everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face and and he's gotten punched in the face plenty of times life is going to surprise us and our memories are going to drift if we don't have a strategy ahead of time say here's who i am who's who where i want to be in the future here's how i'm going to get there then we will fall off that wagon because life will knock us knock us off so it's the plan that helps us keeping on track to where we want to go nice i love getting done just good a couple seconds windows. earlier yeah i love All right. it not investing number 19 paul go all right so what people often do is one of two things 
they tend to build up because most of our clients are between 300,000 and 2 million of annual income. They've got money to set aside into stuff. They let it build up and then they set it aside. They let it build up and then they set it aside often because somebody positioned a product to sell them. But what I would say is for most clients, they're not investing right now. They are saving, putting some money aside in savings types accounts and they're speculating meaning they're investing in some real estate partnership or they're investing in a specific stock or they're investing with some asset manager that's promising outsized returns of some kind, they're not investing. That if you are only setting aside money and savings, you are going to lose to inflation over time. If you are speculating, your losses when you make bad bets will likely overcome your good bets. To be in the center, make sure with the appropriate amount of savings and speculation, but primarily have a strategy of investing in an academically allocated, globally diversified portfolio. Cool. Not building a team of counselors. Go. Ooh, you're going to me take that one. All right. So it is often that we have seen people be in a position where they have a person that they listen to. And what comes for there's safety in a multitude of counselors is an ancient proverb why because the multitude of counselors will help you suss out what is true or accurate for you one of the things that we dig into a lot periodically we come into an environment a client is paying us to do the design work for them for their finances and they may have some other advisors in place already and those advisors have largely been having their opinions accepted by the client. So instead, what we do is go in and say, well, why does your advisor disagree with us? So let's get the whys, then let's bring it back and test it. It's that testing and the iron sharpening iron of that team that helps make sure your decisions are leading in the same direction that you want your future to go. Cool. All right. Number 21, Corey is max out your 401k. This is nearly financial heresy that we would say this does not help you financially. Max out your 401k too early in life. Corey, go. So you picture the person straight out of college, just getting started in their first full-time job, and they're encouraged by whoever, their grandpa, their advisor that they have to max out your 401k. Easy first step, no brainer. Except that 401k is deferring taxes, kicking the can down the road to sometime in the future. And the question is, why is that valuable? Because it's, oh, you're going to defer taxes until you're in a lower tax bracket later on. Well, lower than what? Lower than when they were 55 to 65? Sure. But the very beginning of their career, it's very likely that they're at the lowest tax bracket they're ever going to be again in their life. Let's pay some of those taxes right now. But that's not even the biggest part. The first coming out of school, no savings account and they're putting all their money to a thing that they can't get at for 30 something years. That's the bigger problem is that they need to build up other things like liquid emergency fund that we already talked about. Then they'll earn the right to invest in the market and lock up their money for a long time. Right on. Okay. All right. Now let's, let's turn the coin, make your 401k, your only savings and investment vehicle, no matter what your age you are go. The biggest problem we find with this is the income of our clients. If you are somebody who's making $500,000, dollars dollars a year, you could max out your 401k your entire life and you will never get close to the amount of capital that needs to be set aside for you to have the amount of capital at work for you to reach definite financial independence and fund your work optional lifestyle. Second, you end up with little to no taxation diversification. Everybody talks about asset allocation that is how your money is deployed in stocks, bonds, small cap, large cap, international. Then you have asset location, meaning can I access it? Is it in a midterm bucket, a short-term bucket, or long-term bucket? And last after that is asset taxation. Do we have a diversification of places money is, Roth type accounts, tax deferred accounts, and tax free accounts, and taxable accounts so that we can pull from money from the most appropriate place at the time we need the distribution? Corey, look at that. I finished seconds early, but Corey likes letting like the it. bell ring on me. Notice he just left. No, it I'm just trying to next... just trying to catch it. You know, yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. the hand. I think you just like you like it ringing <laughs> over me. Just like it looks like I didn't make the cut. Notice that never happens to Corey when he's keeping the buzzer. Okay, Corey, number twenty three. 
We are narrowing in on the end of 25 for this episode. So take too much risk when you are young. Go. So picture a 21 year old with no cash reserves, just getting started. They might not even own a car. They don't own their own home. They're, they don't even know what investing is. And yet the financial industry would say, when you're young, you're in the best position to take the most risk. Just not true. They can't stay they can't tolerate any variability in the money that they have, especially if they're living paycheck to paycheck for their first few years of working. They can't have any of that loss happen in their portfolio. They are too inexperienced in the market. They've got too little cash reserves. They've got too little of that bedrock. They actually have a very low risk tolerance. And if they haven't been able to educate themselves about risk, what risk means, that's the other reason not to take it. Let's not get ourselves into something that we haven't studied and know what it is that we're entering into as a strategy. I think I'm good there. Let's you go are, on to yeah. number 24, Paul. Take two. So we just did take too much risk when you're young. Now 24, take too little risk when you are old. Go. I just got to start by saying, notice that all the ones that have to do with when you're young, Corey's answering, and when you're old, I'm answering. <laughs> I just want to say, I look much older than Corey than I actually And I am. look much younger than... <laughs> <laughs> so with that, the idea is that too often people think, well, I got to be much more conservative because I'm almost 65 years old and I'm going to be taking income from these assets. And I say, stop everything. It's still a study of how much volatility... Can you tolerate in your portfolio? And what is what do you want from your investing experience over the next 20 to 30 years? Because the truth be told is if you and a spouse are healthy at age 65, it is highly likely, and I mean over 50%, that one of you is going to outlive age 92. That means you still have nearly a 30-year investment time horizon even after retiring. And the longer you live, the more likely you are going to live longer, which means your investing time horizon keeps getting further out the longer and the further you get out. I almost caught it. Sorry. I'm trying. <laughs> Honest mistake. All right. Number 25. Corey, why don't you bring us home on this episode, ending with, as a reminder, 100 things you shouldn't do to help get your finances in order. Corey is going to put icing on the cake here of number 25, not reading at least a few financial books a year. Corey, go. A wise person who I can't remember at the moment, Paul, jump in if you remember the name, said, the only thing that's going to change your life in the next year are the people you meet and the books that you read. That was me. And I very much, that was you? You made that up from scratch? I don't believe that. No, no, no. Nope. And, and I'm pretty sure it was John Maxwell. Oh, John, that makes sense. Financial articles aren't enough. White papers aren't enough. We need some narratives that are you know, put together enough to stand the test of time. A book that's been around for a while as a coherent whole to give you some financial strategies, some ecosystems of thinking just to keep adding those ideas or reinforcing old ones so that you can grow over time and grow your education and grow your perspectives on, on money. So with that, everybody, that is our first 25 of the 100 things you shouldn't do to help get your financial life in order. We look forward to having you back next week. We're going to tackle 26 through 50. And I think we're going to be disrupting the middle of this. We have a legitimate somebody we're super excited to have on the podcast upcoming we're not going to release who it is yet but we are super excited about our upcoming celebrity interview so we're going to have uh two more episodes on these topics 25 then i think we're going to be able to slip in our edited version of the celebrity podcast and then we'll finish out the next two so keep a close ear to the ground for upcoming episodes we're so glad you could be here with us today and we hope that this has been a contribution to you being able to design and build a good life.